Uh, good afternoon. For the record, my name is Ta Tania Finanche Anderson, the District 7 City Councilor. I am the chair of the Boston City Council Committee on Ways and Means. This hearing is being recorded and is being live streamed at boston.gov forward slash city dash council dash TV and broadcast on Xfinity Channel 8, RCN, Channel 82, and Files Channel 964. The council's budget review process will encompass a series of public hearings beginning in April and running through June. We strongly encourage residents to take a moment to engage in this process by giving testimony for the record. You can do this in several ways, attend one of our hearings and give public testimony. We will take public testimony at the end of each departmental hearing um, and sometimes in the beginning and also at three hearings dedicated to public testimony. The full hearing schedule is on our website, boston.gov forward slash council dash budget. Our schedule hearings dedicated to public testimony are Tuesday, May 2nd at, at 2 p.m., Tuesday, May 9th at 6 p.m., and Thursday, May 18th at 2 p.m. For virtual testimony, you can sign up using our online form at, on our council budget review website or by emailing the committee at ccc.wm at boston.gov. When you are called to testify, please state your name and affiliation and or residence and limit your comments to just uh, two to three minutes or email your written testimony to the committee at ccc.wm at boston.gov. Submit a two minute video or of your testimony through the form on our website. Um, and for more information on the city budget, council budget process and how to testify, please visit the city council budget website at boston.gov forward slash council dash budget. Today's hearing is on docket 0760 to 0762 orders for the FY fiscal year 24 operating budget, including annual appropriations for departmental operations, for the school department, and for other post-employment benefits, OPEP. Docket 0763, 0765 to 0766, orders for capital fund transfer appropriations. Docket 0764, 0767, 0768, orders for the capital budget, including lo loan orders, lease purchase agreements, our focus area for this hearing will be the FY budget, FY24 budget for the Office of Arts and Culture and Office of Tourism, Sports and Entertainment and Revolving Funds. Our panelists for today's hearing include Naida Faria, Director of Administration and Finance, Office of Arts and Culture, Cara Elliott Ortega, Chief of Arts and Culture, City of Boston, John Borders, the fourth Director of Tourism, Sports and Entertainment. Office of Tourism and Sports and Entertainment. I am joined um, here today by my council colleague, Julia Mejia. Sorry, just trying to get the order of arrival. Um, that would be Councillor Michael Flaherty, at large city councillor. District councillor, Councillor Liz Braden, at large councillor, Councillor Mejia and our district councilor, President Flynn. Uh, for our format for today, uh, we'll go directly to the administration for the, your presentation. Um, we hope to be able to um, hold a conversation that is holistic, understanding how the Office of Tourism, Sports and Entertainment, and the Arts and Culture is working together to make it uh, more accessible to our constituents, um, as well as excited to learn about all of the different projects and planning that you have for uh, the citizens of Boston. Um, so first for presentation, then we'll go to, um, rather first I'll allow my council colleagues a 30 second introduction time and then introduction and, and then the presentation from the administration, uh, then to round one of questioning uh, public testimony in the middle uh, if time allows, a second round of questioning, and if time allows, a third round of questioning. Um, our hearing is scheduled for 2 p.m. to 5 p.m., and uh, we hope to be able to um, 
end on time, but if uh, we have all the questions, our questions answered, hopefully we get all, all get out of here within a couple of hours. Um, so by order of arrival first, uh, Council of Flaherty, you have the floor for a 30 second instruction. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll waive openings to get right into the presentation. Thank you, uh, Council Braden. Council Braden, are you muted? We'll come back, Councilor Mejia. Yes, uh, good afternoon. Sorry that I am not on camera. I have really bad allergies and I am sparing you all of it. Um, but I'm really excited. Uh, I think that when we're looking at arts and culture, travel and tourism, you know, these are not the uh, political controversial departments, right? You know, um, but I really do believe that they're the, one of the most important parts of the work that we do here in the city because it's really about creating culture and creating climate and creating experiences for our residents. So I think that you all play a very vital role in that work. And so I'm looking forward to um, hearing how we can be supportive here on the council. And I want to uh, formally um, and enthusiastically uh, welcome uh, John Borders uh, to the family and really looking forward to supporting um, you all in this work. Thank you. Thank you, Council Mejia. Council Braden. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, it's great to see everyone from arts and culture and um, tourism. Uh, this afternoon. Um, I've worked very closely with arts and culture over the last couple of years on issues in Alston Brighton pertaining to our arts, culture, arts community. So I really value the great work that's been done there and I'm keen to hear what uh, what's in the works for our next budget. So thank you so much for being here. Uh, thank you. Council President Flynn. Th thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you to the administration team that's here. Thank you for the important work you're doing in the city. Um, I have no opening statement. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Council President Flynn. Uh, Councilor Murphy. Hi, everyone. Happy to be on this call. Looking forward to the conversation. I'll wait for um, question, rounds of questions, but thank you. Thank you, Council Murphy. Um, welcome. Um, Chief uh, Ortega, Chief Waters, uh, Director Faria. Uh, I think that there was a request for Chief Ortega to go first, um, and then we'll go to um, uh, Mr. Waters. But um, and we do have a presentation. It will be very short of digital, digital, uh, visual, visual uh, data visualization um, of the uh, breakdown for. Um, public consumption to be able to grasp the numbers a little bit um, easier. Um, so without further ado, Chief Ortega, you have the floor. Thank you so much. Um, hello, everyone. Hello, counselors. Good to be with you today. Um, and thank you for your, your time and energy on the budget. I'm going to talk about the Mayor's Office of Arts and Culture FY24 budget um, and share a little bit more also about what we've been up to in FY23 that's ongoing work. Um, uh, and also just want to recognize that in addition to uh, Nida Faria, Director of Administration and Finance, we also have Kenny Maskery, um, Chief of Staff here as well, um, who can help answer questions. Um, I just want to start with a, a statement um, that our office has worked on this past year um, about the importance of creativity and, and the role of having an arts office in the city of Boston. Creativity is vital to humanity and the arts play a crucial role in creating a thriving, healthy community for all. The arts shape the design, economy, and quality of life in Boston. They are intrinsically valuable and provoke emotion, connection, and action. The Mayor's Office of Arts and Culture envisions a vibrant and creative Boston where everyone can access and participate in the arts. We partner with the local arts ecosystem to support the creative economy through grants and programs, integrate public art into neighborhoods, and increase accessible opportunities for creative expression. We believe everyone is creative and that investing in our creativity will lead to a reimagined, more just Boston. Um, and thank you to everybody on the Mayor's Office of Arts and Culture staff who helped um, craft that statement. Um, so I'm really excited at the, the growth of our office, um, including new hires that we're making and growing our capacity to really build out teams that focus on different areas. So for those of you who have been um, with us kind of seeing the growth of the Mayor's Office of Arts and Culture, it's gone from um, over the years a, a pretty small team to now a more robust team. We're gonna be, um, I think, going over the 20-person 
Um, Mark and FY24 were all fully staffed. Um, and that lets us build out different kind of core competencies in the office. So we have now a cultural planning team, a public art team, a grants and programs team, administration and finance, and then the Strand Theater. Um, so I'm gonna share um, some of those highlights from FY23 that inform our work um, going to the next fiscal year um, and start with public art. Um, so over the past summer, um, we had 87 emerging artists living or working in Boston who brightened our streets through the paint box program. Um, these are the colorful utility boxes um, that you see all across every neighborhood in the city. And we were proud to commission so many new artworks um, by and for members of our community through the paint box program and we'll be continuing that um, in the next fiscal year. And we have funded a variety of short-term public artworks and long-term kind of permanent public artworks as a part of um, city capital projects. And just some examples to share there, um, at most Park Park in Jamaica Plain, artist Robert Chow, Hydesport Task Force, and local community members worked together to paint a new mural called Afro-Latin Music and Dance. Uh, more than 50 youth uh, were engaged in brainstorming the elements that were a part of that design, including who was represented and um, what themes were represented. 15 participants, including young people, artists, and volunteers, worked with the lead artist, Robert Chow, to design the mural, and dozens of residents um, turned out at a community um, meeting to offer input on the design. Um, and then more community members actually participated in the painting um, and installation of that, uh, what turned, which turned out to be a 163 foot long mural. Um, through the Transformative Public Art Program, we allocated more than $1 million for the creation of 11 new murals across Boston this year, um, this past calendar year. So a lot of that was in FY23 as well. Um, in terms of long-term artworks at Boston Arts Academy, um, there are two new works from this past year um, that complement that new state-of-the-art um, facility in Fenway. And also just wanna um, mention most recently the unveiling of the Embrace, which was an effort across various city departments, including Mayor's Office of Arts and Culture, um, obviously in, in deep partnership with Embrace Boston um, by uh, artist Hank Willis Thomas on the Boston Common. So just a truly awesome example of how much art can shift our narratives and image of the city that was an incredibly exciting moment this year. Um, in grants and programs, uh, we've built a lot of process in FY23 that brings us to a point this spring where we anticipate um, encumbering ARPA dollars specifically in the categories of supporting BIPOC cultural organizations and also supporting downtown and neighborhood placemaking. And I think every year in our budget hearing, when we look at the numbers, our, um, there's still a lot left to spend and it's because all of our grants go out around this time of year. So all of that funding is accounted for in our, in our operating budget. Um, when it comes to both our operating budget, grant dollars and these ARPA dollars, you know, it's no small feat to steward a process around these funds. Um, we were able this past fiscal year to hire a director of grants and programs to lead program design and a community panel to review um, over 140 letters of interest for the cultural investment grant. Um, and we're in the final stages of that process now. Uh, we're also finalizing an application for the placemaking funds, which we anticipate will support programming that starts this summer, both at a neighborhood level in terms of block party celebrations, street closures, as well as um, citywide multi-year events like large festivals. Um, this year, the city also awarded over $200,000 to 30 artists and creative workers through the Opportunity Fund. That's another program that we anticipate continuing in FY24. Um, Boston-based artists and creatives use these funds to produce studio albums, short films and plays, feed small creative businesses, um, improve the quality of their teaching artistry, create gallery spaces and free programming, um, and, and much, much more. This year's grantees um, on the individual artist side live in um, nine of Boston neighborhoods. Of those who, um, who responded, 70% of the grantees identify as women or non-binary, 43% identify as members of the LGBTQ plus community, 64% as people of color, um, and sharing some of those numbers as we kind of continue to um, improve on how we're marketing, how we're kind of targeting our funds um, based on who has access historically to funds and who does not, um, and that we can uh, report out on that again this year the same way we did last year. Um, when it comes to supporting arts and culture groups and collectives and organizations, we awarded over $600,000 in grants to 160 arts and culture organizations across the city. Um, and we tried something a little new this year where we also supported um, grassroots open studios events led by artists um, in each of our neighborhoods as well. Um, lastly, when it comes to grant making, um, we piloted a new program where we invested uh, $200,000 to support 12 local productions at the Strand Theater. Um, and just some examples of what that supported. Um, the Boston Modern Orchestra Project produced um, a series, uh, uh, a new opera about the life and times of Malcolm X. 
um, mega show, an annual event featuring Cape Verdean artists, um, was also at the Strand Origination, um, was able to um, produce uh, our story celebrating the African and African-American experience through spoken word, music, and dance. Um, and Company One Theater, um, again, came back to the Strand uh, this past summer um, with Can I Touch It? Um, with all tickets being pay what you want, which we love to have at the theater. Um, and then lastly, in grants and programs um, with our Poet Laureate, Portia Laiwola, we had 25 Poet Laureate events um, and 56 City Hall Gallery shows. Um, and we are, uh, we will be hiring soon for a new um, uh, director of, of the City Hall Galleries um, after John Crowley, our longtime gallery steward for almost 20 years, just retired. Um, Moving to cultural planning, um, we have a cultural planning team for the first time in FY23, um, and that includes adding um, two positions this year, development, review, and community engagement. And just to give you a sense of what that allows us to do, um, having those positions means that we can be actively involved in over 30 development projects across the city. Um, included in these projects are over 50 artists live work units, providing affordable housing options for artists. Um, these projects also account for nearly 400,000 square feet in new cultural space. Um, in the arts and cultural ecosystem in Boston. I also want to celebrate that um, as we've been growing this work and I've been in conversation uh, with many of you and many of your constituents about the need for affordable space, we did have a huge accomplishment this past fiscal year that couldn't have happened without um, all of us really working together, um, including with artists and advocates. Um, and that was our ability to invest in the preservation of um, Humphrey Street Studios as an affordable artist workspace in perpetuity. Um, so uh, artists came together, worked with us, um, worked with counselors, um, and in partnership with um, economic opportunity, private financing, um, a friendly developer, we, are, we now have 45 artists who are able to keep their workspaces affordable in perpetuity, and which is a real, um, just a, a real milestone for us. And I know we've kind of, we've heard it before and when we had a, a council hearing specifically on artist space, but I think it's worth mentioning again. Um, we are also this year, we um, piloted a new program where we really felt like we needed to prioritize within our own operating budget, uh, the preservation and supporting new affordable cultural space. Um, and we are in the middle of that um, new program right now, the Cultural Space Fund. So this received 147 applications from around the city, totaling $22 million in requests. Um, and we anticipate awarding 1.7 million to around 30 arts and culture um, groups, organizations, uh, businesses across the city and to secure the long-term future of existing cultural spaces and space operators in Boston and expanding equitable access to those spaces. Um, so those awards are gonna support uh, space acquisition, design, construction, repair, renovation, um, rehabilitation and, and other capital improvements um, and also pre-development costs and capacity building so that um, it's not just those groups that um, already have their foot in the door when it comes to um, managing or accessing space who can receive these grants, but we're also kind of seeding projects earlier on. Um, so we're really excited about that. This is definitely proof of concept for how, how the city can create a funding source through zoning, through our operating budget, administer those funds, um, and design a program to distribute that funding according to, to the need and impact um, to our communities. So we will be repeating that in FY24. Um, and evaluating how this pilot program went and making some changes uh, accordingly. So looking ahead to um, next fiscal year, um, in addition to continuing those programs I just highlighted um, some aspects of, um, we are first and foremost focused on encumbering our ARPA funds. So I mentioned that we have paths for two of our kind of ARPA allocation categories. Um, there are also two areas of work that are gonna be a priority early in FY24, the first being the ARP corridor in District 7. Um, so we're working on a scope of work now um, and hiring an FTE that will support uh, moving those funds. Um, there's also a grant that's going to go out before the end of this fiscal year to support kind of immediate activities around the art corridor as well. And um, Councillor um, Anderson will continue working with you closely on that. Um, uh, the second kind of ARPA allocation category um, or project that we're prioritizing is a collaboration with BCYF. Um, so we've been in conversation with BCYF about what it looks like to bring high quality arts classes and programs to the centers. And we're um, working on a pilot program to um, contract for that across three centers as a way to um, really kind of test what that needs to look like, what support needs to look like for that, how to evaluate those programs. Um, in terms of FY24 operating expenses for the office, um, we are really excited to be welcoming back the mural crew to the arts office. 
Um, that's something that you should see in our, our budget. Um, there's a lot of possibilities uh, with doing that, including connecting the crew to our expanded mural program um, and the expanded contract that we just announced to support murals over the next three years. Um, and really building out kind of youth pathways and pathways for emerging artists um, through the mural crew opportunities. We've also launched work on City Hall Plaza, which you'll see really take off in FY24. Um, halfway through this fiscal year, we were able to bring on a City Hall Plaza engagement manager who's helping to pilot new programs, take advantage of all the new spaces that are there, um, and it, you know, really see it as a new public venue. Um, so uh, that person has been hard at work, um, Billy Dean Thomas. We have 23 events scheduled, including music festivals, film screenings, a range of workshops on dance, uh, chess, um, how to engage in civic art making, and also cultural celebrations, um, including Hispanic Heritage Month. Um, lastly, um, we are part of the work of several departments to better facilitate event permitting and the um, kind of event permitting process for constituents. Um, so you'll see two positions in FY24 that are dedicated to that process, which is um, really a direct response to constituents asking all of us at the city to make process improvements, make things clearer, more user friendly, um, and simplify those requirements. So we look forward to, um, to tackling that in partnership with um, definitely our friends at um, TSE &E, um, and uh, licensing and many others as well. Um, so I think I will stop there. Um, I know I just threw a lot of information, um, but happy to have a conversation and answer questions and find ways to collaborate. Thank you so much, um, Chief Ortega. Um, Karishma, are you ready with your presentation? All right, hello everyone. This is just an arts and culture overview. One second. So this is the org chart that is presented in the uh, capital, but uh, it, that's presented in the operating budget. So this is just a screen grab of that. This is the arts and culture recommended, uh, FY24 arts and culture recommended by expense type. So we have contractual services at 49.8%, personnel services at 48.8%, followed by the total amount. Um, the it's color coded on the the legend itself is color coded so you can kind of draw back draw your eyes back to the actual pie chart to kind of see what percentage of fy24 is going towards different expense types in this powerpoint you will not be able to see a programmatic breakdown because in the department there's only one program that's listed in the budget so this is why you're just going to be seeing a year-on-year -year breakdown of the specific arts and culture program so this is arts and culture expenses over time um, from FY21 to FY24. So FY21 is actual spending, FY23 is appropriation, and FY24 is recommended. This is all in thousands, just so people can be able to see this in a little bit more clarity. As you can see here, in the next, uh, as you can see here, we have approximately $500,000 increase in personnel services, approximately $30,000 decrease in contractual services, approximately $10,000 increase in supplies and materials, $1,000 increase in current charges and obligations, and uh, equipment has gone down to zero. This is a breakdown by expense type. So essentially trying to see that difference over time. This is broken down by um, dollars. So if you look at the first bar, you'll see change 21 to 22 in dollars. So we have $121,000 increase from 21 to 22, a $528,000 increase from 22 to 23, and a $473,000 increase from 23 to 24. And in total from 21 to 24, we have a $1.1 million increase. If you go down to contractual services, you'll see that there was a decrease in contractual services of $31,000 from fiscal year 23 to fiscal year 24. And if you go down to supplies and materials, you'll see a $10,000 increase from fiscal year 23 to fiscal year 24, and a total of a $13,000 increase from fiscal year 21 to fiscal year 24. Essentially, the points that are important in terms of year on year for the most most um, recent year is that yellow line. And if you want to see kind of given a holistic four year view, that green line is what you wanna be looking at. It's in total not by thousands, just again, so people, have, so people can see it a little bit more clearly. This is broken down in terms of percentage. So essentially what I did is I saw how much, how much has it changed from the original. So from fiscal year 21 to fiscal year 22, there was an 11% increase in personnel services. 44% increase from 22 to 23, and a 27% increase from 23 to 24, and then 103% increase from 21 to 24. So as you go down, you'll be able to see that, and it matches up kind of by the dollar amounts in the previous slide. 
for some of the numbers you're going to see here, they are going to seem a little bit big, but that's entirely because what we're looking at essentially is a percentage change. So if the original number is relatively small and you know you double that, it's just going to seem like a lot more. But if you go to the previous slide, oops, sorry. If you go to the previous slide, that uh, large number for current charges and obligations is only $24,000. It's just going to look relatively big at 100, 111% just because of how small it originally started. So hopefully that makes sense. Let me know if you have questions on that. Um, and then this is just a capital project revolving fund and external funds kind of uh, overview. So the capital projects for this department are listed here. What I've done here is I've looked at the total authorization. So kind of all the capital funds that have gone into these projects across existing for fiscal year 24 and for the future. And I've looked at specifically for the fiscal year 24 and then I've looked at capital expenditure. So that's essentially, you know, what money has already been spent in these specific projects. As you can see here, a lot of these projects have not actually requested money this year. It's only the percent for, um, for the arts that is requesting $4.4 million. Um, this is the project name kind of broken down and this is a table essentially broken down to the millions. So you'll be able to see, um, for example, the project bookmarked, it had an authorization total of 0.25 million, so 250,000 and the capital expenditure of 250,000. There's only one project that had an external fund which is the Emergent Memory Coconut Grove Memorial at $145,000 um, and no projects had any grants or um, had any grants funding. So that was not actually put in this PowerPoint, at least according to the raw data and the budget book that I had access to. This is the revolving fund, strand revolving fund, the total amount being requested this year is $300,001. And this is just kind of a history of that kind of historical spending and requests. Um, and then this is a public art revolving fund. So the total amount being requested this year is 800,000. And this is a history of that as well. And this is just the external funds that are active as of fiscal year 24. So in the budget book, if these were these had numbers listed next to them, I kind of populated them on this um, on this slide. So as you can see here, there's Art Lab, Boston Cultural Council, Boston Red Sox Arts Fund, Emerging Artist Program, Grants to Individual Artists, Classic Internal of Sculpture, and Surdena Foundation. And I've listed the amounts that were requested in this fiscal year as well below these specific bullet points. Oh, the amounts that were listed in the budget itself, considering their external funds. Thank you, Karishma. Of course. Oh, sure. Um, we can we can get deeper into it um, later at the council's um, request. Uh, thank you very much for that amazing presentation. Um, I think we can uh, go straight to. Um, I think we can go straight into to tourism and then do. Um, or should we do, I, I guess, just sort of uh, checking temperature here, like should we do the questions with arts and culture and then do tourism or is there a time constraint with you, um, Chief Borders or, okay. Um, then we'll go straight into line of questions for arts and culture. Uh, in the order of arrival, Council Flaherty, you have the floor. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. And obviously thanks the, uh, for the presentation and I appreciate uh, Kara, uh, Elliot Otega and your responsiveness, uh, particularly uh, your department recently when we were dealing uh, with uh, the mural um, over um, over in JP. So I know that um, and the folks that you've been working with over there are excited that uh, they were able to connect with your team. And also if, uh, and I do have a constituent, um, a retired uh, police officer who would like to um, volunteer and teach, and, uh, teach kids um, chess who I guess from your department, could I connect him with that uh, and can facilitate um, that opportunity? He's an uh, expert chess player and I think he wants to share his time and talents with our youth. Uh, that's exciting. I, I was just mentioning that on City Hall Plaza, we're gonna have some chess workshops and tournaments. So there actually might be some opportunities right away. Um, but counselor, you can feel free to connect, connect him to me and, um, and I can put him in touch with the right staff. That'd be awesome. I really appreciate your attention to, to detail on uh, all things art and culture. And appreciate it. And the Frederick Douglass Mural, I know that um, hopefully that will um, get uh, a redo, I guess, if you will, and let us know what we can do uh, for the council level, not just with that mural, but other murals um, that are across our city that uh, are beloved and uh, appreciated and respected. And we need to make sure that they uh, stay in great shape. But it, it doesn't, I don't think it necessarily falls under the CPA uh, Community Preservation Act. 
funding, but um, in the event that it doesn't, uh, if there's opportunities for your department to connect folks to resources and or to artists that could uh, refurbish or um, refresh, if you will, some of the uh, murals that we have across our city. Yeah, I think uh, to that point, I know that the public art team has been um, creating a list of those murals that are just starting to fade or have been kind of um, not fading for some time and, and need a touch up. So that is something that they're looking at now. Um, and I, I believe we can um, cover that through our, con our public art conservation line in our operating budget once we get into FY24. So I'm making that list now and hopefully can start tackling it um, this summer. Thank you. And then in areas where there may be uh things might be defaced or um, vandalized. Uh, do you work closely with the graffiti busters uh, for the city to make sure that there's a prompt uh, removal of tagging, et cetera, so that we can uh, re re return and restore these, um, you know, public edifices to, to, to great uh, state? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, it, we've been in conversation with 311 and with property management about how to get the right workflow so that when something is tagged, we can get called in and find an artist who can um, paint over it or, or get in touch with the original artist of that mural or that paint box, whatever it might be, um, and get it um, kind of back to its original artwork. Um, so we've been working on that now and have been able to catch a couple of things. Um, I wouldn't say we've perfected that workflow, but, um, but uh, making progress on it for sure. Well, thank you to you and your team. Look forward to continuing working with you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, um, Council Flaherty. I was hoping I could get lunch in between, but you are, the time is too short. <laughs> uh, Councilor Braden, you're with us? Yep. You have the floor. Thank you. Um, thank you, um, Cara, for your presentation. Um, I think we're faced with this sort of thing almost like we're always having to be sort of be reactive rather than proactive. Is your department able to sort of help with um, planning in terms of anticipating displacement before it happens and then um, maybe mobilizing assets and resources to help prevent displacement? I know we've had this conversation and and do we need to actually be much more proactive in the way we we um, uh, approach this in terms of displacement of our artists and musicians across the city. Yeah, I mean, I think you've um, hit the nail on the head. Um, we would love to be able to be more proactive instead of reactive. And I think uh, the cultural space fund and some of what we're piloting there, the, um, one of the, the funding sources of that fund is the uh, zoning in the South End um, in which creating affordable cultural space or a buyout of that requirement is, is a part of zoning and written into zoning. And that's definitely something that as a tool, a policy tool, we'd like to um, be in conversation with the BPDA about um, as a possible way to actually have enough funds kind of ready to be able to respond to something in real time as opposed to feeling kind of like we're six months behind or a year behind. Um, I would also say that the community engagement position in cultural planning is a really critical piece of this, because as we see um, when artists communities are more connected and more networked and more organized um, and in touch with us, then we're able to kind of be as ahead as we can be on something like an imminent displacement. Um, and so that position and that kind of grassroots work is, is really critical. Um, that team is also working with, um, and uh, this came up in the cultural space hearing, but we're working with MAPC um, and also in partnership with Somerville and Cambridge on creating a new tool that would allow us to really track cultural assets um, and define very broadly um, so that we are kind of constantly checking on where things are, you know, has ownership changed? Have we heard from that community? Um, and we'll really like be the actual um, data that we can rely on um, so that we're not, uh, you know, just being responsive to things when we hear them, but we can kind of proactively follow up with cultural spaces. So I think those are some some things that are promising um, in terms of getting ahead of that. Um, but yeah. I think there's a lot more, just the more kind of um, integrated that we are into like the planning and um, development review and zoning reform processes, the, the better because, um, you know, we can look at a map of the city and start to guess, you know, where, um, neighborhood change is going to result in a displacement of those kinds of spaces. Yeah. 
Thank you. Um, and I also say, you know, do a recent experience thinking about capacity building in the artist community as well, because very much um, in terms of uh, community organizing as, an, as a group, they're, they're a very um, a varied group with different, um, different niches in the, in the cultural landscape, and they don't necessarily all communicate with each other. And um, is there any scope or capacity to tap into funds to help do capacity building in terms of um, in, in that community or communities in general? Yeah, that's a great point. Um, and it's it's something that we've noticed as well. Um, we are in conversation on that team about um, using some technical assistance funds or cultural planning funds to actually do workshops for artists on how to organize, um, how to understand, how to participate in city process and BPDA process, um, to understand also who else is facing the same issues. I think um, we've seen artists also be really siloed by the kind of work that they do and you know there might be you know a building down the street or one neighborhood over that's also going through the same thing but they're just actually not connected um so we have talked about um possibly supporting a series around that for capacity building very good and i also would put my um we have some griff we have some murals that we've done a long time ago in austin bright in the middle of love so um that the idea of the uh, public art con um conservation uh, we should probably be in touch with you with a few a few of our um, long-standing murals that are getting old and a little shabby and they need a little help so um and i'm looking at madam chair and am i how am i doing for time madam chair 30 seconds 30 seconds oh well that just gives me time to say thank you cara and i look forward to work and continue to work with you in your office um all things um, arts and culture in in my district of alston brighton thank you so much Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Council Braden. Council Mejia, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, and thank you, Kara, for the presentation. I just have a few questions. Um, I'm curious if you could just, there seems to be some sort of disconnect or misinformation about like the difference between the commission, the arts commission and the arts and culture department. Um, there's been some advocacy done um, on behalf of a group of folks who want to have a statue in Jamaica Plain in the park at Mozart, and they just don't know who to talk to. And if for the record, if you don't mind helping our uh, viewers understand kind of what the difference is and the role in terms of oversight and all that decision making processes just looks like because there is a, a misunderstanding. And I, I have one more question after that, just so you know. Sure. So um, the Mayor's Office of Arts and Culture uh, staffs two commissions, two independent commissions. One is the Boston Cultural Council which is our local cultural council that receives state funding and also has some city funding um, to re-grant uh, in Boston. And the other one is the Boston Art Commission. So the Boston Art Commission uh, has a regulatory role in approving public art on public land and is also our commissioning body. So when the city goes and says, we want to pay for a piece of public art on public land, the Boston Art Commission has to approve that um, as well as approve the final artwork. Um, so. We, while we staff that commission, that is an independent regulatory body. Uh, when people want to put public art on public land, whether that's for a short period of time or a long period of time, um, we ask that they submit an online application um, that will get them in the um, agenda for review by the Boston Art Commission. Um, and that commission may have feedback on design or on process that they request um, in order to move that project through to eventually being accepted by the Art Commission. Um, and as one might imagine, that um, the process for a long-term artwork that's going to be around for, you know, 10, 20, 50 years is um, very involved um, compared to the process for something that's short-term um, that might be a mural or might be an installation. Um, and so that's, that's a part of uh, their process as well. Um, so when someone wants to propose a long-term artwork, um, we, uh, the Art Commission has um, kind of specific standards that they're looking for, um, including, you know, having a maintenance plan and, and all sorts of other things to make sure that anything that we put into the public realm can really um, stand the test of time. So um, we staff it and we're happy to help people understand that process and also understand what other kind of funding sources or other support is out there for public art, um, but the approval lies with the Boston Art Commission. 
Oh, that's great. Thank you for that, Kara. Um, and then I guess the the uh, the follow up and that I have, and I'm just curious about uh, this program that was just initiated through the city Artivism. So Danny Rivera was really engaged in activating it. And some of the things that I learned um, in that process was that you, they were uh, targeting younger artists, you know, emerging artists. And so I'm just curious about kind of like the energy that exists around creating a pipeline of artists and starting them younger and what role, if any, your department interfaces with the Boston Public Schools and other organizations that are art driven for potential yeah. partnerships. No, so important. Um, we are, the, the way that we do that the most is by supporting and working really closely with the organizations that provide um, creative youth development, whether that's in BPS or out of school. Um, many organizations do both. Um, and so we support them um, financially, but also with technical assistance. Um, this past year, we actually started convening a group uh, uh, not just of those organizations, but also of creative employers and higher ed in the arts to have a conversation about how are we kind of working together to really make those pathways clear to young people and their families? Um, and what are the barriers to doing that? Do we really understand, you know, the full landscape of what those jobs are or what the benefits of arts and culture are for young people? Is that being communicated clearly to families? And um, we know that a lot of um, youth programs have really long wait lists. Um, so just kind of starting to unpack that and, and try to understand, you know, what what could the city do um, also as a convener, not just as a, a funder um, to address that and to um, maybe pilot some ways for people to work together, even on simple things like, um, you know, a creative career fair, or opportunity fair, and people have something that can Hello. really centralize. Um, oh, good. How you doing? something that can really centralize uh, access to all of those different programs and just make it clearer. Because I think there's, um, for a young person who's interested in, in arts, there's just like a lot of digging that one has to do in order to figure out how to support that. So, um, so we're having that conversation now um, and hopefully that can kind of convert into some program ideas um, early next year. I will say I'm really excited about the possibility of the, the mayor's mural crew um, and how that could be built out into a much bigger, um, uh, youth program in a variety of ways. Um, obviously, like young people could always be helping with murals, but we've seen other programs um, around the country that have really turned that into a workforce development opportunity. Um, so we're excited to, to talk to other cities and talk to arts educators and think about what that could look like for us. Right. And so that I'm clear for folks who are tuning in that that art is not just the visual art. There's also spoken word, there's drama and and trauma <laughs> and all that other good stuff that goes in, in that's interconnected and so the last thing that i i will just kind of uplift is that for me is art is, is not something that is just reserved for those who um, have unlimited resources right that it's a privilege for some folks to take an art class or to do something and i'm just curious as you continue to develop your your budget priorities um can you just share with us maybe two or three specific things that you're doing to be more inclusive of diverse uh, experiences. And not just in terms of just not just black and brown people, but I'm talking about social economic status, just um, status, you know, even doc documented or undocumented, kind of like we just get, when we think about, when, we, when we're thinking about access and inclusion, you know, we always go black and brown, but I just want to uh, push us a little bit and also look at inclusivity of disabilities, it, documentation status, you know, language. So if you could, that would be great. Yeah, um, I think uh, just because you just mentioned disability um, access, uh, we have an artist in residence right now who's specifically focused on um, the accessibility of the city and how that's perceived and experienced as someone with um, with a disability um, and her whole project revolves around that in partnership with um, the transportation team. Um, and right now uh, that program is getting ready to have, I think their final projects and there will be kind of a presentation I think that we're gonna have on the plaza um, about you know how as an artist moving through the city that is experienced and what some of the recommendations might be. So it's thinking a lot about you know, the design and culture of the city and how the city feels, um, not kind of uh, arts like capital A, like fine arts, but kind of what is the culture and the feeling of the city and how does that um, impact individuals? Um, 
Another thing that comes to mind is uh, through another program we've been supporting, Design Studio for Social Intervention, that's doing something called the Design Gym in Upham's Corner. Um, and this is a space that is just open and free to anyone and um, really sees itself as a place where like community members, young people, artists, cultural practitioners, culture bearers of different kinds, chefs, like everybody can just be in one space and take classes, organize together. Um, and some of that is kind of creative classes, but the point is really like building that social connection and helping people understand that they can actually have agency in changing the city and impacting the city. Um, and I think that's a really great example of kind of a shift toward arts and culture and creativity as something that everybody should have access to. Um, and it's just a part of everybody's life as opposed to this kind of um, special privileged space the way that you were talking about. And I don't know, Nida or Kenny, if there's any other examples that come to mind. Yeah, Kenny, do you wanna share about the cultural access? Sure. Um... Kenny Maskery, Chief of Staff with the Mayor's Office of Arts and Culture. Um, as part of the um, cultural consortium of the Museum of Science, the Aquarium, Children's Museum, and um, Aquarium, um, we launched an RFP to help figure out what a process could be to give free access to those cultural institutions um, with students who have BPS IDs, so extended access opportunities. There are already access programs, but this is really looking at a more um, universal and less cumbersome program where um, BPS students and their families can receive um, free access to those cultural institutions as part of um, every Bostonian's right um, to access to um, culture and those institutions. So this RFP is in the process of um, being reviewed so that we can implement a plan, um, hopefully for the fall, so that we can kick that off as a pilot project. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Councillor Flynn, you have the floor. Council President Flynn. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and I see um, and was listening closely to Kara in her comments. So I want to say thank you to you, Kara, for the important work you're doing. I had the opportunity to work with you on some murals and some public art in Chinatown, especially. But we captured, or I should should say, the the artist captured with the community the the important role immigrants play in the community, in working families and in addressing, um, even addressing hate crimes that we've seen against the Asian community here in, here in Boston. I think public art really showed, um, showed the story and, and also it showed the story about the resilience of the, of the community. So I wanna say thank you to, to you, Kara, and to your team um, and I guess, I guess my question, Kara, is I see sometimes these beautiful murals and these artists and they're painting these wonderful murals and they've spent so much time on them. And then, and then I see a couple of weeks later graffiti on it. Um, so it must be frustrating to to you, but certainly to the artists. But what is what 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 can prevent us from um, people mocking these beautiful murals up with graffiti? Yeah, I think um, I mean there's a certain extent to which you know we live in the city, <laughs> things are going to happen, and this is why we're we're trying to create a system for. Um, being able to touch those up and kind of intervene and work with the artists when that, when we see some tagging or things like that happen. Um, I do think, you know, we've also been having a really great conversation with property management and with the mayor's mm -hmm. office about what it looks like to create like a positive space for graffiti. Um, you know, there's a certain amount of graffiti that's always going to just want to happen um, where, you know, on murals or on other spaces. Um, but we also know that graffiti can be an amazing art form. Um, we have a lot of amazing writers in town, um, graffiti artists, 
And um, there's been uh, a lot of conversation about where we can have space for that, where there could be like a free wall. And I do feel like it would be good as a city for us to um, have like a positive space for that. That's not kind of tagging the artwork that, that already exists. Um, and so that's something that hopefully we can continue to explore. But other than that, I think, you know, this is why we have conservation dollars. It's why we have maintenance funds and plans and, um, you know, to be prepared for, for all of those, um, those things that will just happen. Um, but I think given every, every counselor in their district has, whether it's um, existing murals that have been um, tagged or uh, murals that are fading, I think something that will come up as a follow-up for us from this conversation is to reach out to each of your offices and just see um, what's on your radars in terms of like, if there is a hot spot where things are being, you know, marked up all the time, or there is something that's fading, like let's make sure let's that we, that we prioritize that and get that in the beginning of our fiscal year budget. Well, thank you, Kara, and to your team. I also want to acknowledge the important work of graffiti busters, but also public works and one, one or two departments that I think are also critical to this is Office of Immigrant Advancement. And they often have great ideas about how we can celebrate the contributions of our immigrant neighbors through art. So just wanna, just wanna highlight Office of Immigrant Advancement, Language and Communication Access for the important role they play in our city as well. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Council President Flynn. Um, up next, we have Council Murphy. You have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, Kara, and your team for being on. And um, to piggyback on what Councilor President Flynn just mentioned, um, I do love when you see the art. And I know a lot of our walls, um, BHA housing, like the one in the South End and one in Dorchester right near my house. I love those big paintings that are going up. Um, and the electric boxes around the, you know, the city, it's, it's, it's nice to see. And I do think it also as an at-large city council, it really shows the, like the culture, the feel of different neighborhoods. It reflects the different, you know, and so that, that's nice. Um, just here to listen and make sure that you have enough money coming into budget season um, as a, you know, someone, anytime we've had hearings or we've talked, you know, I'm a big supporter of the arts and I do know how they directly affect our mental health, our you know growth, and all of you know the social development of not just young kids, but you know even seniors. Earlier today, in between these budget hearings, I went over to Grove Hall and was with the senior center, and they're making quilts out of old um, sweaters, and we were playing musical bingo. So, and it's the Memory Cafe over there. So there's just so many benefits across the city and the senior outreach, but also, you know, making sure that our BCYF and all of our city departments are getting the funding they need, but knowing also that they have their own budget. So to make sure that we're making sure that you are not expected to like stretch your budget to support other departments who can ask for it themselves, right? So to, when we get into the budget season and I'm looking you know, at all of where we're in the budget season. We're here to talk about it, but if there's anything um, specific or things you feel that we're missing before I pass it over to my next counselor, is there anything you wish you saw or something you were hoping to have in the budget that you want us to advocate for? I'd love to hear. Uh, thank you, counselor. Um, I don't know that there's anything missing from the budget, I think the areas that have been priorities, we've been really intentional about piloting something so that, you know, this time next year, we can say this is what our ask would be around something like cultural space. Um, and um, cultural space is really the, the main area where um, funding, you know, it takes a lot of funding to have an intervention. Um, but I think between the zoning reform ideas, um, some of what came up in the, the last um, uh, council hearing that we had on affordable space for musicians and other artists. Yeah. Um, there's, a, there's some, yeah, that was great. Yeah. 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 There's some different policy, um, items that I think, you know, we're in a position to move forward that can create a funding source, um, that can be deployed without just kind of adding to the operating budget in a fiscal year. And I think that's a smart thing for us to, to be trying. So 
Um, so nothing um, specific uh, outside of um, looking forward to, you know, getting those conversations going and thinking about the next steps on them. Okay, no, thank you. Um, that, that's all, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Council Murphy, Council Louis-Jean. Thank you, muted. Keep on making rookie mistakes. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, um, uh, Chief Elliot Ortega, for the presentation. I think you sense from everyone the enthusiasm, the shared enthusiasm with murals, the just the, the level of dopamine and excitement and joy that artwork and public art um, can provide to our residents. Um, so then definitely, uh, we were driving in JP earlier today and was looking at one of the new murals going up on the side. Uh, like I can't remember the building, but just we're really excited about that. Um, and um, I want to thank you for um, the leadership that your office showed for the displaced residents, the displaced artists um, as a result of the Sound Museum and um, the work that you're able to do with them as alongside Councilor Braden's office and others. Um, I know that I spoke to some of those are, um, of, of the art, recording artists. And so, and, and I know Councilor Braden also asked this question about um, how we can be more intentional and more, um, what's the right word, um, uh, proactive with uh, getting ahead of these displacement issues. I know that my colleague, my council colleagues, Coletta, Fernandez Anderson, and, and, and Braden held a hearing specifically on this issue, but when we're talking about displacement, looking at the development that's coming in and seeing are we able to negotiate community benefits specifically for artist space, for um, for whether it be um, visual artists or recording artists, like are, are we building out a strategy to be able to, to negotiate with developers, especially when the displacement is, is when the development is, is specifically displacing or having an effect on um, artists um, and also how we're thinking about it with respect to all the other things that we usually want from developers. And I know that there are trade-offs. So how are we thinking about as a city when we, um, when, when we're trying to decide what needs to be prioritized, whether we're talking about space for artists, space for nonprofits, affordable housing, those sort of trade-offs. Hopefully that makes sense. Yeah, no, that's, the, that's the big question. Um, I think a couple of things as we continue to be kind of embedded in planning and development review, um, we are gonna be looking at um, uh, creating a recommendation for the city around which areas should prioritize either creating that kind of space or um, supporting through community benefits, funding that space somewhere else. Um, and there's a few different ways that we can think about that, right? We can think about the cultural districts around the city, parts of the city that have had strong cultural um, centers in the past that have been lost or that have them now, but they're at risk. Um, and those would be geographies we would wanna focus on. Um, another one is thinking about where there's like light industrial space around the city that might be converting into housing, which we really need. But we also know that when we lose those spaces, we lose spaces for people to make um, creative work. So there's different ways to kind of look at the city and say, these are the areas where if development came here, we think it should do X, Y, and Z. And we're, we're working on articulating that now. Um, I think additionally, this is why we have um, uh, been trying to create one fund to hold the mitigation dollars and community benefit dollars from these projects. Because as you all know, you know, in, in an ideal world, we would be able to just recreate what was lost right next door, but that's not how the Boston um, land market works. Um, and the best thing for, you know, a music community or a visual arts community might be to move to a different neighborhood, like wherever that space is available. Um, and so we need the flexibility to be able to centralize some of those funds and then be able to move them around also because that's more equitable, you know, if we're only um, creating cultural spaces where development is happening, then that's leaving out large chunks of the city. So um, those are some of the things that we've been we've been trying to work on. Um, but that first part is definitely a, a policy that we want to take a, a stab at um, and see if we can um, work with BPDA, mayor's office. Um, again, zoning reform is going to be a big way that that could happen um, and see if we can embed that as a policy. Um, thank you. Um, I appreciate that answer. I also a lot of times we get these benefits from developers as, as part of community benefits agreements, but there's actually, there's, I'm not gonna say always, but oftentimes there's no follow through. So we have something that was 
promise, but we don't ensure the execution. And I think like we are leaving dollars on the table, much needed dollars on the table for our cultural institutions. And so um, the more that we are able to, and this is something I've talked to BPDA about quite a bit, to ensure execution when we do, when when we do, our, when communities are able to negotiate for, you know, whether it's IQR, right? IQR in Brighton saying that they are going to provide physical space for our artists. How do we ensure that that happens and stay on them to make sure that, that happens? Um, and, and so I, I just want to see us do a better job as a city, whether it's monetary, um, whether it's um, uh, uh, monetary or actual something material um, that we are able to follow through on that. Um, and I guess my other, I, my other, my other just pie in the sky idea. I think that um, I, I just want to see us do a better job of supporting. Um, and I think my colleagues have said this too. Like young BIPOC artists, um, it is really expensive to rent space. It is really ex it is really hard for folks to know that they can be an artist. It is really hard for folks. You know what what I've heard, you know, from from being able to like obtain the artist preference, even when it comes to housing, that there's a lot of um, there's a lot of uh, disinformation, lack of information around that process. So I know that I <laughs> see Kenny here as your chief of staff. I know that's going to be a focus of uh, of your office. I just want to double down on the need for us to really um, to be working with the artists. I just talked to an artist the other day who uh, Ayanna Mack, who's doing an incredible job in in and and making it and grinding it, but it's not without without struggle. And um, if we're you know rooting these conversations in equity, thinking about what we have to do with the historical reasons why our communities lack the capital to be able to survive as artists. I mean, so I want to see more of our dollars going to that work and more of our dollars working with our communities and 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 you know strengthening their culture. Like I'm Haitian, I know that there's a there's been an, an thank ask you, Fassler. For like a, a a little Haiti, so just putting that on the table. Thank you. I don't know if there's time to respond to any of the things that I put out there. I would just say I uh, definitely agree. Um, youth access is something that, um, and just uh, supporting youth programs, I think is something that we need to do a better job of outside of just working with the youth serving organization. So I would just, just agree with everything you just said. Uh, thank you, Councillor Worrell, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, uh, Chief Elliot Otega and the rest of the team for being in all the work that you do uh, here in the city of Boston. It is uh, helps beautify the neighborhood, and I appreciate all of it. Um, I have a couple questions. The external funds that goes to the Strand Theater, is, is that just more so for maintenance, uh, for operating? Um, what, what, is, what is that fund for? And then also, I love the Strand, grew up going to the Strand and seeing so many plays and performances. Um, in terms of usage, are we seeing like the increase um, booking of the Strand for um, shows coming in and performances? Uh, thank you, Councillor. Um, in terms of the revolving fund for the Strand, and Nida, feel free to jump in here, but most of that does go toward um, the direct costs that we have in the theater. So purchasing supplies, um, fixing things. There's a lot of things to fix in a, a building from 1918. Um, and also I, from the revolving fund, we also pay ushers and things like that. So um, that's that's what that entire fund is um, supporting is the, the direct cost of operating the theater. Nida, am I missing anything on that? No. Okay. Um, your second question about usage. Um, we're seeing a lot of demand for the theater. We did last year as well. There's a lot of events. There's a lot of people who want to do work there. Um, it's, I think, um, come back. You know, we were obviously uh, closed at one point during COVID. I, I don't see um, uh, those numbers as being, you know, lower than they were pre-COVID necessarily. Um, it's been hard for some organizations that maybe usually do productions in the Strand that are still kind of making their way back and. Um, so we have had a couple of organizations that have said, you know, we can't do a production this year and we're still recovering from the impacts of COVID-19. Um, but for the most part, um, it's it's been pretty well used. I think um, our biggest challenge right now is actually just staffing. We have um, a vacant position um, that we need to get posted and filled in order to support um, the technical production side of the theater. Um, and that's just a, it's a really challenging market right now. Um, every theater is having 
a hard time finding technical staff. Um, people have, um, after COVID, uh, many, many people who do that kind of work have actually just gone into other lines of work entirely. Um, so that's something that we're working on and troubleshooting now, but, um, but the demand is there. And we can and, send some yeah. exact numbers if that's helpful. Um, yeah, I guess that would be helpful. Um, a few advocates um, would like to also advocate for murals in, in these areas. Um, there's a bridge on Norfolk Street, um, it's the Norfolk Bridge. Uh, we're doing over like, we did over the steps last year, I think there's some beautification going on, um, these iron um, uh, guardrails, but at the bottom of the stairs is this wall. Um, and at the, also at the bottom of the stairs is a, is a vacant lot uh, that the community is looking to turn into a community garden. And, and we would love to see if we could turn that wall in front of this community garden at the bottom of the stairs into a mural. Um, it's, I believe it's on Babson Street or Mascot Street, but I can get to the, um, uh, the actual 82 Mascot Street, I believe it is, um, is the address of, of this wall. And then we're also um, hoping to have done uh, St. Lawn Park, um, which is a soccer field, but right across the street from St. Lawn Park is a bridge um, that's on the corner of Columbia Road in Richfield. And there's these big columns and then there's this wall um, where the soccer players usually hang out uh, while they're playing soccer uh, or before they play soccer. Uh, Cause on Saturday, Sundays, it's, it's bustling over there. We'll love to see if we can uh, create some sort of grant to, or if we have a grant to paint that underpass and just beautify that underpass. Cause it's, it's a very active uh, area during the summertime. Uh, with, with soccer leagues. Great, we have a note of both of those. Awesome, thank you. And um, one of my other, um, would love to learn more about cultural districts. I know that we have four here in the city of Boston. Uh, what, what goes into uh, creating a winning uh, application for a cultural district? Sure, so uh, cultural districts, are a designation from the state, from the Massachusetts Cultural Council. So the city's role is a little bit as intermediary. Um, a local group can apply to the state in partnership with the city. Um, it also that requires city council approval. Uh, and then the city enters into a memorandum of um, agreement with the entity that is technically managing the district. So for example, Boston's Latin Quarter, and Hyde Square is managed by the Hyde Square Task Force, and we have an agreement with them about what goes into that. Um, each district is a little bit different in terms of, I think, how they would define success, um, but all of them are focused on you know, creating and supporting arts and cultural activities, um, supporting local artists, public art, um, activating um, the geography of the district, um, and a couple of them are more focused on um, kind of tourism and bringing people in. The Fenway Cultural District works with the institutions in the Fenway, and so um, they do a lot of thinking about how people um, have a sense of belonging and access to that area and to those institutions. Um, but we're, I think what we're seeing a lot of is um, people turning to cultural districts as a way of preserving their, their cultural identity and their heritage, um, which is something that we really want to support. Um, so in this past year, uh, we also made matching grants um, to all of the cultural districts so they were getting both local and state support um, so that they could really do those programs um, that really reflect the populations that are there, right? Which is part of what they're trying to make visible. Um, so that's um, just like a quick sense of yeah. what goes into that. Um, but we're happy to talk to anybody who's interested in the district program, um, happy to connect them to the state as well. We work in really close partnership with the Mass Cultural Council. So that's usually just one, one big conversation and I'm happy to help anybody with that process. Absolutely. And I, yeah, I'd love to connect you with um, those who are inquiring about this process. Um, and then I just have a few budget questions so I can have a, a deeper understanding of the numbers. Sorry, was, um, Council Rao, your time's up. Um, can I just ask this one question just to sure. get it on the record? Um, is uh, what, what, what services are we contracted out? Um, and then the last one is what goes into other current charges? In the last two. Um, 
Chief, I'll, I'll, I'll be happy to allow time for that. Um, we're gonna go into our next uh, conversation with uh, Tourism Office of Tourism. Um, Mr. Borders, if you are ready to do your presentation, your floor is yours. Uh, well, thank you, Councillor. Um, I will not be presenting any slides, but I will share an opening statement. Uh, good afternoon to all of you. Thank you so much for the opportunity to share. My name is John Borders IV. I'm the director of the Office of Tourism, Sports and Entertainment for the city of Boston. Our office is a part of the Economic Opportunity and Inclusion Cabinet, whose vision of Boston is that it would be a resilient, economically equitable, vibrant and sustainable city, a Boston that centers people and a Boston that creates opportunities to build generational wealth for all. As a cabinet, our shared priorities include COVID recovery, neighborhood revitalization, shifting city investments, and prosperity for all. Our office is making impacts across each of these goals with investments in equitable recovery of the tourism industry, downtown and neighborhood activations, and ensuring Boston remains a vibrant and inclusive city for the residents and visitors. The mission of our department is to advance tourism and promote public participation in public celebrations from both residents and visitors to our city. We do this by producing and supporting events across the city, by supporting film and TV production, and by marketing the city to conventions and visitors alike. The Tourism, Sports, and Entertainment team is a small department composed of 11 full-time and part-time employees 27% female, 73% male, 36% identifying as black and 64% identifying as white. We are committed to ensuring that our office reflects the diversity of our city and we are mindful of that when making new hires as well. In fact, this budget request for new positions gives us the opportunity to further diversify our department. Our office produces annual <laughs> public celebrations that include Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Day, where we partner with Boston University and New England Conservatory. One Boston Day, Amy Yandel's favorite, the Donna Summer Disco Party, Gospel Fest, and the Mayor's Trolley Tour, just to name a few. We are bringing back our dance party series to the plaza again this summer, and we will feature salsa, R&B, house, and Afrobeats music and dancing, just to name a few. We're also providing support to neighborhood events throughout the city. Here are a few samples. The Anderson Tree Lighting, BAMS Fest, the Caribbean Festival, Chinatown Lion Dance, the New England, the, excuse me, the North End Feasts, the Greek Parade, the Haitian Parade, Juneteenth, Roxbury Unity Parade, St. Patrick's Day Parade, Vietnamese American Community Cookout, and the tree lightings across the city. We are also looking ahead to future events. For example, the 250th anniversary of our country will take place in 2026. We're already working with Councillor Bach and other partners along the Freedom Trail and across the city and region to make sure that this occasion is a grand celebration and highlighting Boston in the best possible light. 2026 will mark the 250th year since the American colonies declared independence from the British Empire but Boston also will celebrate 250th anniversary of other important dates that predated the signing of the Declaration of Independence, such as the Boston Tea Party, as well as the Boston Massacre. The FIFA World Cup bid. In June of 2022, Boston was selected as one of 10 North American cities to host the 2026 World Cup. Really exciting news for our city overall. The 2026 FIFA World Cup games will be the largest to date with 80 matches featuring 48 national teams slated to take place, 60 in the U.S., 10 in Canada, and 10 in Mexico. The Boston Consulting Group's research has estimated that the individual 2026 FIFA World Cup cities can expect upwards of half a million visitors and a potential net income of half a billion dollars. The Army-Navy game, the bid uh, will happen in Gillette Stadium, uh, for 2023, and this game will be played this December during the second weekend. The game has never been hosted in New England, and its anticipated event will draw more than 40,000 uh, fans from out of 
from out of state, excuse me, out of state visitors to generate approximately 35 to $40 million in economic impact. BAM's Fest, Boston Arts and Musical, Boston Arts and Music Soul Festival is one of the fastest growing urban arts and music festivals in the Northeast celebrating Afrocentric identity and black artistry, all while amplifying the voices and creative contributions from local, regional, and national entertainers of color. BAM's Fest envisions a vibrant and inclusive arts and culture sector for the city of Boston and beyond. This festival celebrates all artistic talents, challenges societal perceptions, and empowers and engages audiences. The other events on the horizon include Boston Unity Cup, the NAACP National Convention, Boston Calling, the Wasabi Fenway Bowl, the NCAA Division I Indoor Track and Field Championships, the NCAA Men's Basketball Eastern Regionals, and Broccoli City Music Fest. Our office is committed to making sure that the city of Boston has an array of fun and engaging events for residents and visitors alike to enjoy. Thank you all so much for your time. Happy to answer any questions you may have. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Borders. Um, I will open up for uh, my counselors to ask questions, my colleagues to ask questions first. Um, uh, Councilor Flaherty or Braden, uh, not here. Councilor Mejia, you're up next. Great, uh, thank you, uh, Chair. Um, thank you, uh, Director, Director Borders, Borders, Cabinet Direct, well, Commissioner Borders, what's the title here? Just wanna make sure I, I don't, I, I... Director. Director Borders, I wanna make sure I get it right. Um, thank you. So, hold on a second. Um, so I just have a few questions. And again, I'm really excited that the mayor has created uh, a position that is specifically geared towards really looking at tourism and entertainment and even sports and knowing your background in the sports arena. I know that you're gonna bring it and really help expand it here in the city of Boston. So I'm really encouraged by all of that. I guess, you know, um, some of the things that I think about in terms of tourism here in the city of Boston is that, um, you know, a lot of folks across the country um, do not think that, you know, Boston has people of color living in it, right? So, you know, the video that was put out, uh, All Inclusive Boston, you know, there's been a lot of initiatives and efforts made to make us feel and appear to be more inclusive. And I'm curious about, in terms of how you think about your work in these three different bucket areas, um, you know, what more can we be doing to support that initiative through the work that you're doing in your, in your, in your office? Um, thank you so much for the question. There are definitely opportunities to continue to expand the efforts. Uh, I had a conversation not too long ago with both Colette Phillips as well as Darren Bascom of Proverb, uh, Colette doing our own, uh, having our own consultancy group, but then Darren, who was over Proverb, uh, who actually helped to lead the initiative. Um, and we have the ability to probably amplify uh, the collateral pieces and content that were already created. Uh, I know that we, our office is looking to do an additional phase uh, of marketing to continue to, to highlight the 23 neighborhoods that make Boston the city that we know and love and care for. Um, and I think there are different opportunities for us to dive deeper into really reframing how Boston is seen, countering the perception. Boston is 51% BIPOC, 21% black. So knowing these things, how do we continue to frame and reframe the city of Boston publicly? Uh, I think it is by, by amplifying uh, the amazing award-winning all-inclusive campaign that we already had um, and figuring out what another phased approach of that marketing could look like. Uh, already kicking around some ideas and having different conversations with potential local influencers who can also tell their story um, and really figure out how to shape the narrative of these different neighborhoods. Uh, for so long, Boston has been viewed as being extremely segregated, but we have an opportunity to reframe that if you want authentic cuisine, if you want this experience, you can go to this neighborhood and have it. Uh, so I think there's an opportunity for us to really amplify placemaking and what that looks like and, and to deepen the relationships with, with local vendors. I think one of the things that we also have to do 
as the city of Boston is to encourage residents to get out of their own neighborhoods and move around. One of the things that we're trying to do is to think about tourism, not just in the sense of dollars coming from outside of Boston and greater Boston, but what does it look like to challenge residents to move outside of, of their, their spheres of comfort? If you live in, in West Roxbury, how about you go to Roxbury for dinner? If you live in Brighton, what would it look like for you to go to Roslindale? So I think during things like Restaurant Week and finding these different these different opportunities, what would it look like for us as a city to promote these different challenges, pushing people to different neighborhoods yeah. to engage? Yeah. Um, and yeah, and I'm, I just get nervous when Councillor Anderson starts saying, thank you, thank you. So I've got one more question that I wanna get in there, if that's okay, Councillor Anderson, can I get one more just please? Oh my God, it's, it's okay, so I'm just gonna, this is new, John, You're, this is, you know, Matt, this is your first time here and so like, um, I, it's just two questions. One is around the Black Heritage Trail and just some investments that I'd like to see there. Um, and then the other is, um, uh, and I'll talk to you offline, I do have some ideas around circulating some of these dollars across the city. As a citywide city councilor, I, I, I do agree that we could, do, we could be doing a lot more to engage from Beacon Hill to Mission Hill, right? There's from the South End to the North End, there's activities and things that we can do to help build culture and, and, and community across the city. So I'd love to just, I'm signing my name up for um, some idea sharing that I have for you, but can you just talk to me a little bit about the Black Heritage Trail versus the Freedom Trail in terms of funding? Because I feel like the Black Heritage Trail seems to be the stepchild of the city. Understood. I don't have the exact numbers in front of me in terms of budget and what's being spent on each, but I can definitely get back to you with that information. So I just want to get that on the record, Councillor Anderson, that I'd like some follow up on the discrepancies between both of those trails. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Uh, Borders, uh, Director Borders, if you can submit that within the next um, seven business days, that would really be appreciated. Um, you can email it directly to my office or through um, the administration. Um, and they'll get it to me and uh, Will or to all of us. Uh, thank you, Council Mejia. We've, um, we've been joined by Council Lara, but first it's Councilor Worrell. You have the, uh, wait a second, no, nope. Council Lujan and then Council Worrell. You're on mute, Councilor. I keep on doing that. Um, I want to say thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Director Borders, for your work. I, I guess I'll just start off and like the, just want to also celebrate the enthusiasm of having this position in the city. Um, I, I guess I'll, one of the things I will uh, piggyback off, off of what Councilor Mejia said recently in my office, we walked the Black Heritage Trail. One of the things that's missing from it is the, like actual markers. There are no markers on the Black Heritage Trail compared to the Freedom um, uh, to the uh, Freedom Trail. So if, if there could be markers, something that Councilor Bach and I stated, like she lives on the street that has at least two of the sites for the Black Black Heritage Trail. So markers, I think, for the Black Heritage Trail would be good uh, in making it. There, so there is there are there's signage for the actual trail, but the landmarks themselves don't actually have signage to say this is part of the Black Heritage Trail. So that's one investment that I think could go a long way in making it a more popularized trail. And then um, second is in the efforts to really share Boston's history. There, we have a lot of really great oral historians, a lot of really great walking tour guides. My first job here in the city was as a walking tour guide um, when I was 14, really sharing the history of Boston's neighborhoods. And I think that there's incredible work and synergy there. I've been talking to folks about what would it look like to really support um, a lot of uh, the work that, that they've already done and sort of building out the oral history of, of this city and especially with their black and brown lead. So I think that could be an incredible project uh, for your office to help undertake. Um, and then uh, the other things that I, I would mention, but I'll stop there. Council Orrell, I'm sure would, would, would have wanted to talk about uh, getting the all-star game here in Boston. And I know that's something that you care about and that you have the connects and the ability. So just wanted to put that out there um, and thank you for your leadership and your work. Um, and if there are ways that we can support you and your office in this budget, um, definitely look to us as partners and allies to getting that done. Um, Boston is a fun city. It's a city that attracts a lot of tourists and we need to make sure that we're attracting that tourism to our neighborhoods that have a lot of like rich history and like you said, rich dining options. Thank you so much, Councilor. 
happy to work with you uh, offline in, in, in greater detail with all that you just shared. Thank you. Thank you. Council Lujan, all set? Thank you, um, Council Lujan. Uh, Council Rowell, you have the floor. Councilor Barr, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Director Borders, for being here with us today. Uh, I am excited to hear, did I, did I hear correctly that you said that the Broccoli City Festival is coming here? It is, in August. Wow, okay, I didn't know that. I'm excited about that. That's a good get for us. A um, great get. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say that's, that's actually incredible. As somebody who has traveled to other cities to go to that festival, I'm very happy that it's coming here. Boom. So um, I have a couple of questions. There is an increase in the film and special events line item for your budget. Can you talk a little bit about what projects are your your off? It's, it's right now for FY24, it's 925, 794. Can you talk a little bit about the projects that you're hoping to, to take on with this film and special events line item? Say that one more time. It was it was a little hard for, for me to hear you. Can you can sorry? You there is a line item in your operating budget for film and special events. That is nine hundred twenty-five dollars seven ninety-four. And I'm curious about what that line item covers in your office. Um, I know that we are working closely. Uh, to actively streamline the process of permitting for all those who will who will film um, and, and do uh, different work in the city in terms of different <coughs> um, public events. Um, so I think some of that uh, will go toward um, better positioning the city to tell the story of who we are and the work that we're doing. Um, I know that some of uh, that has to also do with capacity building um, in terms of bringing on uh, proper support um, in certain positions to assist uh, with this work. Uh, but I can go back in detail and, and uh, share more information with you and with the team. Great, and part of the external funds is the $150,000 for the City Hall Plaza Fund. Can you, for the record, share, do you know what the City Hall Plaza Fund covers, the $150,000 there? Um, I will get this information for you. Thank you. Uh, and my last question is more along the lines of what I've heard my other council colleagues share, right? There's like a lot of ideas about ways that we want to activate the city and that we want to activate you and your office. But right now I'm looking at this budget. There's a 13% increase in the budget and that's primarily due to a new position, right? For, for the deputy director. And so we have all of these ideas. We're like, oh, this is incredible that we have this position. Here are all of the things that we should be doing, but the only increase in this budget is for a staffing person. It's like, no, there's not any programmatic increases. And so I just wanted to, I wanted to lift that up that we are seeing an increase from FY23 here, but it's primarily for a new deputy director. And so if we're thinking about all of the things that we want this office to do and all of the ways that we think that you're well positioned to really activate the city, we're gonna to have to make more investments programmatically to the office. I will not argue with you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Director Borders. Thank you, Madam Chair, no further questions. Uh, thank you, Council Lara. Um, what we didn't do is have Karishma present uh, the data visualizations on the numbers um, because it's a, smaller budget, um, I think we still have time to do that, but I'll go into my questions first and happy to do that if uh, counselors feel um, it would be helpful. Um, for my questions, um, Director Borders and uh, Chief Ortega, um, I'll ask for arts and uh, tourism together. Um, and my questions for you, uh, Director Borders is, in regards to what Council um, Lara just mentioned in terms of programmatic, um, can you tell me exactly the amount of money that is going into um, con contractual um, into contract for your budget? I'm trying to look for the breakdown now. I should have the answer, but I guess the question is, um, can you can you break down what it's for? 
um, for my full budget or for the for programming? Uh, your question was a little unclear. Forgive me. Sorry, for your full budget, how much did you get in contract and what is it for? Or proposed? I don't have the full budget pulled up in front of me, but I'll be able to get you that information. Okay. Um, we can actually, Karishma, are you still here with us? Ready with your um, presentation? Okay, so I guess um, really quick, um, Director Borders, there was, a, there was funds that I moved last year in amendment process for uh, $75,000 for African um, events or carnival. And specifically, they were gonna go to West African um, community that wanted to do a carnival this summer. And I know that it needs to be taken care of before June. So i um, looking forward to connecting with you on that um, specifically. And then obviously any way that we can support in terms of amendments to looking at contractual amounts. I, and I think that's where I'm getting going with this. Like there's not enough money in contracts. What are we doing exactly? How intentional are we being in allocating funds to make sure that we are actually supporting our artists or communities um, to doing the, some of the programmatic stuff that you're talking about. Um, but Karishma, if you have the presentation ready, we'd like to see the breakdown and I think that would help us with more questions. All right, this is just gonna be a quick breakdown of the tourism budget. Um, so this is just a background, um, kind of the department mission and the cabinet that's under. And this is the org chart that is available in the budget book. And this is the percentage of the FY24 recommended by program. So if you can look to the right here, film and special events takes up 51.5% at $925,000. Tourism administration takes up 36.5% at $657,000. And tourism itself takes up 12% at $215,000. And you can see that breakdown in the pie chart on the left. And then this is the FY24 Office of Tourism recommended by expense type. Um, if you look on the right, we have the highest of personnel at 58.9% at $1 million. Contractual services at 20.7% at $372,000. Supplies and materials at 1% at $18,000. Current charges at 3.3% at $60,000. Equipment at 1.4% at $24,000. And other expenses at 14.7% at $263,000. And if you look to the left, you'll see them lined up in terms of that pie chart. This is the City Plaza Revolving Fund. This is just the amount of money that's being requested this year. And historical spending in FY23 was $150,000. There was no spending prior to that year, at least in the from FY21 at the very least. This is the Office of Tourism Spending by program over time. So we have Tourism Administration, Film and Special Events, and Tourism the left which is a program and then total amount by thousands on the bottom so as you can see here from fy23 to fy24 we have approximately a hundred thirty thousand dollar increase in terms of tourism administration we're pretty stable on film and special events and approximately a hundred and ten thousand dollars in tourism increase um, something to note here is that there was a decrease in tourism administration from 1.4 million dollars to $530,000 from FY22 to FY23. This is tourism administration spending over time by expense. So we see personnel services, contractual services, supplies and materials, charges and obligations and equipment. In the following slide, we'll actually see how much that breakdown is year on year. Um, just, I wanna direct your attention to the right where you'll see the legend in terms of, you know, blue is for FY21, green is for FY24. And here we have the change in terms of dollars. So we see that from FY22 to FY, FY23 to FY24, there's an increase of $133,000 in personnel, $5,000 in contractual, $9,000 in supply, oh, $0 in supplies and materials, $0 in current op charges and obligations, and $0 in equipment. Um, if you want to, the two points I would direct your attention to is that FY23 to FY24, change and that FY21 to FY24 change in case you were wondering about kind of a holistic view of the cabinet or of the department itself. And then this is just by percentage. Again, some of these percentages are going to look very high, that 2000%, but that's entirely because um, we're looking at just differences in terms of starting amounts. 
And then we have film and special event spending over time by expense. Um, as you can see here, it's broken down by those expense types as well. And then on the next slide, we'll see kind of what that changes. So in 23 to 24, we have a $26,000 decrease in personnel um, expenditure, no $1,000 increase in contractual services, $1,000 increase in supplies and materials, and kind of thirty or $22,000 increase in equipment. And then this is just broken down by percentage, just so that it's a little bit easier to kind of see how we're moving from year on year in terms of total line item. Then this is tourism spending over time by expense. As you can see here, there's, uh, there's a $100,000 increase in personnel services and the remainder of the line items stay relatively stable. And in our next slide, we will see that. Um, in terms of uh, fiscal year 21 to fiscal year 24 increases, we see $100,000 increase in personnel services and $32,000 increase in other expenses. And this is just by percentage. The, this is just the change in terms of uh, percentage. And then this is just a breakdown of departmental history versus external funds by expense type. So in the left, we have the expense type. The top two expense types are the only two that had uh, external funds and departmental history. So the top, uh, the top expense type is special expenditures or special appropriations. And the second is contracted, contracted services. And so we see $263,000 out of the operating fund for special appropriation and $100,000 from external funds. And we see $345,000 out of operating expenditures for contracted services and $50,000 out of external funds. And I think that is it. Thank you Thank so you, much. Karishma. Um, Thank you, Karishma. Uh, happy to share that breakdown with you as well, uh, Director. Um, Please do. Please absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Chief uh, um, Ortega, are you still with us? Yes. Awesome. Um, is it okay? Would you be able to send me um, uh, in by email or whatever um, when you have it a breakdown of your know, contracts and grants um, in terms of demographic locations and amounts? for um, arts and culture. Yes, we can do that. Thank you so much. Um, and then same with murals, uh, breakdown of location and the artists' um, demographics. Yep, and yes. Thank you so much. Um, I, that's, for me, that's all the questions that I have. Um, the floor is open for my council colleagues. By raise of hand, I can call you for further questioning. Um, we've been joined by Councillor Coletta, I see you on camera. Um, I'll allow you to go first for your questions. Chief Ortega, um, Arts, I know that you were here earlier. I'm sorry that you missed you. Actually sent me a message that you had something important to go to and I got it too late, um, but thank you so much. We welcome you back. Um, so Chief uh, Car um, Elio Ortega from Arts and Culture, John Borders, um, Director of uh, Tourism and Entertainment. You have the floor, Council Coletta. Thank you so much, Chair, and I appreciate the indulgence. I did have to run at three o'clock right as my questioning was, was about to uh, happen. So I do appreciate this second opportunity um, and I will be brief. Um, and thank you, Chief, again, for your work. Uh, thank you to, to John as well. Direct, are you director, Chief? I, I want director. Okay, I wanted to get your title correct. And director. Correct on your name. Director. Congratulations. I know that you've only been in for about um, two, two months, two weeks, uh, whatever it is, but welcome. Um, thank you. So really excited to be working in deep partnership with the Office of, of Arts and Culture. This is the chair. Um, I appreciate all of the, the questioning from my colleagues. Um, thank you to the chair for asking for demographic data as well on, on and everything that we're doing just to ensure that we have um, equ equitable distribution of resources and where um, we're creating uh, vibrant, healthy communities through, through arts and culture and, and um, uplifting artists where we can, especially uh, emerging artists. So I know that we had a, a conversation in regards to rehearsal spaces and it's it's been brought up and just its role in, in maintaining and growing a creative economy in, in the city and there was a policy position of no net loss of culture spaces in the city of Boston um, and some of the proposed policies uh, to keep artists um, in place included more predictable community benefits and mitigation expectations for development projects um, city acquisition for space and land for artists and cultural use and then um, citywide zoning reform um, just to enable more cultural uses. So I'm wondering how your budget reflects those policy, uh, those proposed policies. 
and um, and and I guess the the dollar amounts for for each one of those. Um. Yes, and those were all cultural space related. Correct. I'm just going through. Okay. So the our budget reflects that um, within the contracted services line, which is where all of our kind of grants and program dollars are. Um, that's where we have four hundred thousand dollars allocated for the next round of the cultural space fund, which would start in FY twenty four, um, and we're wrapping up that first round now. That's the program that we're piloting, and um, so we're looking to continue that next year, um, and that's where that's represented in our budget currently. Um, we also have some funding set aside within cultural planning for technical assistance. Um, we talked a little bit earlier about having workshops, other things to increase um, uh, folks' capacity to organize around these issues or access different kinds of redevelopment costs or other sorts of things that they might need um, in the moment of dealing with, with a space crisis. So, um, so altogether, that's probably about um, half a million dedicated to cultural space. That's great. And that's included in, in the contractual yes. line. Okay, great. Um, and I know you and I have talked about a citywide funding mechanism for, for cultural space and, and projects. And I am really excited about that work. Um, too often, I think in development projects, certain priorities get pitted uh, against each other. It's either affordability and resiliency or affordability in arts and culture, or arts and culture and whatever. And arts and culture predominantly just tends to get the backseat. And that's something that we really need to um, to, to be proactive uh, and, and work against it. So I do look forward to having additional conversations with you and your staff to establish that citywide fund and utilize zoning to prioritize light industrial uses and, um, and really just be creative um, when it comes to, to trying to find as much revenue as possible um, to establish this fund, which could be the first of its kind in the city of Austin. So look forward to those conversations and any other way that I can be helpful through this budget process, um, please let me know. But that's, that's it for my questioning. Chair, thank you so much. Thank you, Council Coletta. Uh, I know that Council Mejia and Council Rell had more questions um, earlier. I'm not sure if we wrote them down. Um, Chief, did you have a response to, um, I think it was Councilor Mejia who had a question or Council Rell? Um, Council Rell had a question about our current charges and another line, and I can't remember what the other budget line was. Um, but Nida, do you want to say something about our, our current charges? Sure. So our current charges basically are memberships. So we have a couple of um, office memberships um, that will help like with professional development. Um, we also pay out of that our Zoom membership, um, our submittable, which is our grant application platform. Um, and we've been using that for like almost like 10 years. Um, we also, uh, out of that line comes out of like, um, other licenses that we use, um, to create, um, videos, flyers, um, do PDFs. Um, we also have, um, we pay for a hosting for our, our collection management software. So that is both like an internal and soon to be external, um, data collection of all our pieces in the city of Boston. And most recently, we procure a texting software, and this was recommended by Councilor Mejia last year um, to reach constituents. So we have about 2,300 um, phone numbers that we can use to text folks when there's an opportunity coming from our office. Nice. Um, Councilor Mejia, did you hear that? Uh, maybe Councilor Mejia has left us. Um, Councilor Mejia, if you're not with us and have any further questions, um, I don't have any other questions for you. Um, so thank you, uh, everyone, for being here and this conversation. Um, I will submit any other information or questions that I have uh, from my colleagues or myself to you. Um, please email them to me, and I can disperse them to my colleagues or send them to all of us. And if you, of course, have any um, pending questions or information to send us, um, look forward to discussing those as well. Thank you, everyone. And me, uh, our hearing is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.